comprehend the world, science is essential. To progress in science, breakthroughs are required. I've been exploring the nature of scientific breakthroughs, what they are, how they work, what they mean, how breakthroughs differ from normal science, how breakthroughs differ among fields of science, say physics versus neuroscience. In exploring scientific breakthroughs, the nature of what breakthroughs are is one approach. The process by which breakthroughs come about is quite another. When physicists reflect on how they do physics, when physicists review the history of physics, what are the ways in which breakthroughs occur? I'm not expecting a formula for breakthroughs in physics that would be simplistic. What I'd like are examples or case studies of the process of breakthroughs in action. How do scientific breakthroughs happen in physics? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. To explore the process of how scientific breakthroughs occur, I speak with scientists who have studied breakthroughs or who themselves have made breakthroughs. The precision of physics and mathematics provides a standardized playing field for examining breakthroughs. I go to a legendary citadel of pure research, Albert Einstein's home for more than 20 years, the Institute for Advanced Study, IAS, in Princeton, New Jersey. I seek the IAS director, a Dutch mathematical physicist who oversees scores of breakthrough scientists, Robert Digraph. When you were working with so many of the leading uh, scientists, mathematicians, uh, how do you see the process? How does it, mm. how does it happen? How it's a great privilege to see some of these breakthroughs uh, close up and at least see how exceptional scientists and scholars think and work. And I think it's all about imagining worlds that do not yet exist. So it's like peering through uh, like a, a hill and seeing the landscape behind the hill. Mm. And I think there are, there are two forces that uh, allow you to do so. Uh, one, I think, is curiosity, just run uphill and, and have a look. So it's being interested in things that might be very out, far outside your comfort zone that nobody is paying attention to. Uh, the other, I think, is intuition and imagination. It's like seeing certain things in your mind that others cannot see. It's also about picking up very faint signals. Um, so often here at the Institute for Advanced Study, what we try to do is make a very quiet environment so that you can almost listen to the inner voice of science. Little things that not quite fit. A, a pattern that's perhaps suggested by one or two data points. And I think that's part of the magic of science is that you know some people have a very well-developed radar screen mm -hmm. and, and pick these things up and see a pattern. What examples have you seen during your tenure here? Well, I remember uh, an example which was like in mathematical physics where there was a big breakthrough and uh, I remembered uh, Edward Witten being here and reading the paper and saying, well, it's connected to this grand theory of mathematics. There was not, a l not even the smallest part in the physics papers. And it happened on the spot, the paper came out. It was like one hour later. Oh. And he was sketching a program. For instance, I worked with him for the next 10 years. <laughs> and it was certainly there. And so it was, I think, already partly shaped in his mind. It was really on the spot. And it was also spot on. It remarkable was that he was able to capture this in mathematical language formulas that turned out to be exactly right. Now, there's this famous saying, you know, you have a crazy idea, but is it crazy enough to be true? <laughs> These kind of crazy ideas that come with breakthroughs, they often have an internal consistency that uh, make them very solid. And because it's often a new context of looking at something familiar. But to do that, you have to go down a lot of blind alleys. Absolutely, you have to try many efforts. You're not simply, you know, pass immediately over the one hill and uh, enter the promised land. And I think that's not a part of uh, how the scientific process works. Great scientists, I think, have an ability to challenge themselves, to try out many different things, 
to say, well, uh, let's try to do uh, an orthogonal direction and then another one and another one. Mm. I think uh, many of us have had the fortune to be close to you know, geniuses, great scientists, and we see them at work and we see this kind of playfulness of uh, almost forgetting how serious science is mm. and trying things out. Right? It's, it's not a logical sequence of steps. And sometimes uh, I've seen in my own work that, you know, you're collaborating and, you know, you're having a serious conversation and then, you know, it becomes late in the afternoon and you get a bit tired and you make kind of a silly joke. And then certainly there's silence because that joke could actually be true. Mm -hmm. So there's something in your mind by relaxing that, you know, you jump further mm -hmm. than you thought you could jump. And actually, you might actually just jump over the barrier in your mind. In the scientific process, you have periods where you're expanding, you know, you're, you're certainly you're interested in many different things. That is creative too. But I think, you know, every scientist knows the feeling that in some sense, your mind starts to close, you focus, you start to kind of inhale. And, uh, and at some point, you're only interested in one problem and you simply cannot be bothered to think about something else. And often I think the answer is lying just in front of you but you were just uh, too busy. There was too many noises. It was too cloudy to see the answer. And it's remarkable how time and time again, the great breakthroughs are not you know, a long pathway forward, but a small step to the side. Robert is in awe of the breakthrough process, radiating its excitement. He discerns diverse ways and means for breakthroughs to emerge or erupt curiosity, intuition, playfulness, focus. I must now meet the man who Robert features to exemplify breakthroughs. The Charles Simone Professor at the Institute for Advanced Study, Edward Witten is a renowned researcher of string theory, the first physicist to win a Fields Medal, the highest award in mathematics. I ask Ed to describe how his breakthroughs in string theory came about. Ed, you began as a history major at Brandeis, and then you won the Fields Medal, which is in mathematics, and were the only physicist to have won a Fields Medal. How did that transition happen? Well, after some hesitations, I recognized that at the age of about 21, that my talent was really in math and physics, and that's the direction I should go in. And I went to graduate school in physics because I was excited about the elementary particles. I started graduate school in 1973, and something to bear in mind is that the 50s, 60s, and early 70s were an incredible period of discovery in elementary particle physics. All kinds of things were discovered, new particles, new forces, new properties. When I made the decision to be a physicist, I didn't possibly know much more about elementary particles than you do or somebody else who hasn't studied them seriously. But what I want to capture is that there was this incredible period of ferment in elementary particles, which what drove me into the subject. And it also led to the discovery of the standard model of particle physics, where the finishing touches were being applied almost as I was starting graduate school. And then conveniently time just a little bit after that, was another huge experimental discovery, a new particle called the JSI. It had seemingly paradoxical properties, but it turned out it had a very natural explanation in the standard model. And by some yardsticks, it was a clincher in showing that the standard model was correct. So physics was in a new landscape by the time I was really understanding it. The standard model was in place and was coming to be relatively well established. But the standard model involved new mathematics that was quite unfamiliar to physicists, also at that time to mathematicians, whose exploration turned out to be very rich. Hmm. So what specifically was the mathematics that you needed for the standard model that was not just unknown to physicists, but even to mathematicians? Well, technically it's called non abelian gauge theory. Of course, light and electricity and magnetism were known since prehistoric days. And in the 19th century, they were unified in what is called Maxwell's equations by the mathematical physicist James Clerk Maxwell. And by the early 20th century, Maxwell's theory was reinterpreted quantum mechanically. And then we talked about photons, not just electromagnetic fields. But Maxwell's theory is a linear theory. So if I have two flashlight beams, they pass through each other without perceptible interactions. Mm. But the standard model is based on a nonlinear version of Maxwell's equations, where you have to imagine that the two waves do interact. 
and scatter each other. But because they interact, they also can't be treated classically the way light waves can be. So it has to be treated quantum mechanically, and then the standard model becomes much more complicated. Mm -hmm. And the part which is really most complicated is the theory of the nuclear force, the strong interactions as we call it. Where we had the equations by 1973, but solving them is another matter. So as a graduate student, my main interest was in trying to learn how to solve the equations of the standard model. The standard model was all based on this nonlinear extension of Maxwell's theory, this nonlinear extension of electromagnetic theory. And it raised many new questions, which at first seemed like a sidelight, but gradually they came to be more and more important. So in 1976, just the year I was finishing graduate school, there was actually a breakthrough in the math of non-abelian gauge theory applied to these strong interactions, which led to yet a new wave of mathematical questions. Mm. And by the time I got to Harvard as a postdoctoral fellow, the mathematicians as a result were talking more to the physicists than had probably been current for a long time. To give a brief answer to your question <laughs> of what was my journey, uh, I started with interest in building models of elementary particle physics, mm. but the success of the standard model both by answering some questions and by raising others, created a new environment where I found more opportunity exploring some of the mathematical issues arising in the standard model. And that set me on a course that gradually led to more and more interactions between math and physics. It was originally questions arising in the standard model that led to a renewed interaction between physics and math. Mm. And that was the story roughly for the first decade. Then in the mid 80s, there was enough progress in string theory so that that led to a completely new arena. In 1982 and 1983, John Schwartz and Michael Green and Lars Brink had made enough progress that I was starting to take their work on string theory seriously. Mm. But it was clear that it was a very long-term proposition, exactly like critics say today. And so I hesitated to get fully involved. I spent a summer studying John Schwartz's review article on string theory, and I did some minor work clarifying some of what they had done. Did they take you seriously at that point, since you were just coming into the field? Well, there was one point in which they certainly took me seriously. With the understanding of that time, it was impossible to get the elementary particles right, because a very important part of elementary particle physics, which is the handedness of the elementary particles, mm. technically called the parity violation, just couldn't come out of string theory. So I had innumerable discussions with Schwartz and Green mm. about this point. And they ultimately took me seriously and solved it in a breakthrough in, I think, August of 1984. Oh. And I was sitting at lunch in the faculty club at Princeton when a colleague who had just gotten back from Aspen mentioned that they had achieved this development. And at that instant, I knew I'd be working on string theory because it was like magic. If a problem is resolved before you knew about the problem, it doesn't have the same emotional impact as if a problem is resolved when you've been sure. worrying about the problem for a long time. So when they achieved the additional breakthrough in August 84 that made the difficulties in at least a rough draft of elementary particle physics go away, that had a huge impact on me. And I was sure that my interest would never be the same again. So, so by the string of 85, we understood that you could make assumptions about the extra dimensions of string theory that would lead to something a lot like the elementary particles. Oh. But the more we looked at it, the more ways of doing that there were. This ultimately led to questions that people asked later about the landscape. And you famously showed that the five string theories that were existent at the time were really uh, uh, um, limiting cases of really one string theory. Yes. How, how did that come about because of stir. Why it caused was it a stir, but realistically, I added a couple new clues, but I was also putting together many clues that had been discovered by colleagues. Mm -hmm. So a canonical view at the time was that maybe some of the string theories were mathematically inconsistent because of subtler problems that hadn't been appreciated. So in the spring of 1995, I set myself the problem of trying to show that some of the string theories were inconsistent. And for a while, I thought I'd been successful. And the most interesting aha moment was actually in an airplane on my way back from Toronto. I realized that actually there was a loophole in my arguments. And the string theories I was trying to get rid of were consistent. But to understand their consistency, you had to unify the string theories together and also add this new limit that people sometimes call M theory. The story that I presented in a lecture at USC in 1995, where I 
sort of unified the string theories really resulted from an attempt to disprove some of them. I was trying to reduce the number of string theories by showing that some were inconsistent. But what happened instead was to reduce the number of string theories by showing that they were at different limits of each other. What strikes me about Ed's breakthroughs in string theory is the extensive background, both historical and in Ed's own career, whose breakthroughs did not one day just happen. If string theory, which remains controversial, turns out to be truth, Ed Witten's recounting its development will have historic significance. Since the foundation of physics is mathematics, in that all advances in physics must be described in the language of mathematics, to appreciate the process of breakthroughs in physics, how about appreciating the process of breakthroughs in mathematics? I pursue the process with a distinguished visiting professor at the Institute for Advanced Study, the first woman to win the Abel Prize in mathematics for her breakthroughs in analysis, geometry, and mathematical physics, Karen Ullenbeck. I ask Karen how she feels about her own breakthroughs. Every time one gets a nice theorem, one's excited. The theorem that uh, convinced me was I'm a mathematician was a rather technical result, which was, would not be considered a breakthrough. It was more an extension to systems of something that uh, other people had done for single equations. What happens when you actually get the problem is you feel extremely excited. Uh, and this is independent of the world's reaction to it. I, I don't really think it's possible to do mathematics with the idea that you're going to prove something and everybody's going to tell you how great you are. <laughs> it's more the uh, interaction uh, with, of yourself with the ideas. I, I don't think that I recognized my results as breakthroughs at the time. In fact, I could hardly believe it. In my case, the interaction with the external world was actually uh, very tense. I mean, I found it difficult to talk about my work. Perhaps because I was a woman, I felt very much under pressure from the external world. Well, it was 40 years ago, but I don't think at the <coughs> time uh, I, I got much pleasure out of the recognition of my work. I got real pleasure out of talking to other mathematicians about working together and the ideas, but the public acclaim was not something I felt very comfortable with. The being a, a woman in a field obviously dominated by men so, so dramatically, did that have any impact? I'm sure it did. It's hard to know. And the pressure was because uh, you were in the spotlight, as, as it were, for something in addition to your mathematics. I'm not separate from me myself as a mathematician. Me as a person and me and a mathematician do fit together somehow. <laughs> and <laughs> so it, it was not being so comfortable. But I, I certainly remembered the moment um, that I had the breakthrough uh, of how to think about the problem I was working on and trying to describe instant time. Oh. I remember my thesis advisor, Dick Palais, said to me, you should work on this problem. Well, I didn't know anything about it. There were two books, both of which were incomprehensible to <laughs> most mathematicians, and boy, the poor physicists that had to read those books. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, but I, I taught myself the subject, and I saw the step that had to be done. And to tell you the truth, it just had to be done. It, it, if I hadn't done it, somebody would have ultimately done it, because it the field couldn't go on without it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember struggling with it, and it was a question of numbers. And uh, I'm in dimension four, and I could make it with, with a fourth power, but I needed to prove it for a second power. And I struggled and I struggled and I struggled with it, all these fancy things, minimize something, do this and do that. And in the end, uh, I solved it in the most mundane of fashions there are. It's called the continuity method. You uh, get a one parameter family, you prove that at every point along this family, you can solve it in a neighborhood. And then you yeah. prove that if you go on to the end, you can solve it at the end. <laughs> and it's the least exciting and a most useful technique <laughs> in partial differential equations. Do you remember the moment that you came to that realization? Well, I don't remember where I was. It was just, so that's how you do it. It's, <laughs> it's so simple. It's so simple. Yeah. Did, you, did you second guess yourself that it, it couldn't be that simple? 
No, I, I, it, by the time I got there, I saw that it would work right. Did you have any uh, feeling that I, I need to try this out on someone else or have somebody else check this? Maybe I'm missing something. I was pretty isolated at this time. I don't remember telling anybody about it. Do you recommend that for others? Yes and no. I don't recommend working in isolation, but I do think you have to work by yourself. And I also think if you work too much in gr a group of people, then you're all going to be thinking the same mm. way and that the, the Gangs of people working on problems, unless they're really thinking independently, are not that useful. From when I was young and mathematicians were very isolated and did work a lot by themselves, to now when mathematicians almost always publish, in, in, you know, they're in groups and they meet a lot and they take a lot, a lot of jet flights. They, they have a big carbon footprint. <laughs> I, I think that there's a balance between uh, working with others and thinking out things for yourself. To optimize the breakthrough process, Karen advises working by yourself, but not working in isolation. As science projects have grown in size, involving dozens, even hundreds of collaborators, how to discourage groupthink, how to encourage individual creativity. The breakthrough process depends on individual creativity. To explore its mystery, I meet a mathematician who works by himself on complexity theory and the limits of computation, Gregory Chaitin. Creativity is uh, very mysterious. At an anecdotic level, I can talk about what it feels like to be yeah, creative, yeah. And, and one doesn't know how it works. For example, the idea for metabiology came to me a week or so before I got married to my wife, Virginia. So she's been my muse on this. So I can say, get married, and <laughs> that moment can be an inspiration, right? It's very mysterious. Uh, I don't know how you do it. Uh, first of all, you have to be tremendously creative. You have to be a little crazy because you're gonna go off in a different direction from everybody else. And most of the time, that's a big mistake, right? But if you're lucky, you may come upon something. So I think that tremendously creative people are all crazy, but if you're lucky, your craziness matches the next step that has to be taken in some field. And then instead of being just plain crazy, you're a guy who did a breakthrough, right? The sources of creativity. Uh, are very mysterious. Um, I think erotic energy has something to do with it, as I said. Mm. Uh, another thing, I would draw strength from uh, hiking in the mountains in the snow. The beauty of nature was always an inspiration for me. To be more personal about my own life, when I was a teenager, I would read vast quantities of stuff, and I was completely obsessed with science, with mathematics, reading, 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 looking for interesting stuff. It was like a disease. At, one, at first, I thought I wanted to be a physicist, uh, quantum mechanics, general relativity. But then I heard about this mysterious thing, Gettles and Completeness Theorem. It sort of uh, took over my life. So there's an aspect of obsession, this tremendous drive to do something. There's an aesthetic aspect. If you find the ideas beautiful, uh, I used to feel that in some sense, mathematics had a sensual beauty. Sensual. You know, I would put in the same box, a physically beautiful person, a, a beautiful mountain, a beautiful scenery in the mountains, in the snow, and a beautiful mathematical idea. To me, they were all sort of leaked from one to the other. And I think I would feed on the beauties of nature, artistic beauty, in my case, female beauty. And this would inspire me uh, to look for beauty and try to create beauty in, in mathematics. The sources of inspiration, you need, you need energy, you need to throw your personality at it. You need to feel that this is really important for you. It's like having a stone in, the, in, in your shoe. You can't stop thinking about this. You don't want everybody to be like this because it, you, know, you can't be a father, you can't hold down a job. It's difficult. But this is, I think, the kind of thing it takes. How do breakthroughs happen in physics? There are no cookbook recipes to follow. Best is to immerse in the experiences and reflections of those who have made breakthroughs. Curiosity, just run uphill and have a look. Intuition, playfulness, get out of your comfort zone, but then focus. Be attuned to questions or discrepancies in standard theories. Follow them relentlessly, and don't let the long-term nature of the pursuit deter you. 
As big science expands, encourage individual creativity. Discourage groupthink. Seek inspiration, embrace obsession, luxuriate in beauty, concentrate energy. Breakthroughs in physics cannot be programmed, nor can they be sought for their own sakes. Breakthroughs are signposts and shortcuts, revelations, inspirations, sometimes like magic, on the long road with sudden swerves traveling closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.